Hello and welcome, this is the last of the four videos I'm doing for the transition between Year 11 and A-Level Chemistry. This one I've decided to call Real Chemicals and Real Reactions. And it's because a lot of the time we talk about the theory of chemistry and we talk about chemical reactions, but a lot of the time people don't link that to what that looks like, what that is in the real world. And a lot of the time the students have had very limited access to different chemicals and experiments and sometimes people find it very difficult to link theoretical chemistry to experimental chemistry and the real world. I'm going to start off with just an insight into some basic equipment just to give you an insight into the depth of knowledge you need when doing A-level chemistry. All I've got with me is just some apparatus which is used to measure volume in chemistry. Just the volume of liquids or volumes of gases. They're mainly used to measure volumes of liquids but a lot of the time you can use them to measure the volume of gas as well because they're both fluids. So we have measuring cylinders. We have beakers, including this little one. We have conical flasks, ones with a normal top and then ones with a funky top. That's called a quick fit top. We've got test tubes and boiling tubes. We've got this, which is called a volumetric flask. We've got a pipette, and then there's also the small Pasteur pipettes. A burette, and this, which is called a pear-shaped flask, which has also got a quick fit top. And all of those are just used for holding liquids. And that's not even most of the apparatus which is used for holding liquids. And so the question becomes, why are there so many? And we'll start with, well, some of them are used to measure liquids, and some of them are used to contain reactions. And so a beaker it has approximate values for volume along the side, but you wouldn't want to use this to measure out a volume of a solution, because those are really inaccurate. This is mainly used to just contain a reaction. Just you do the reaction in the beaker so you can look at it. That's similar with a conical flask, but conical flasks are such that you can swirl very easily without losing any of the liquid. If you want to do that reaction on a smaller scale, often you use a test tube or a boiling tube, or if you want to heat it and move it around at the same time, these are also just used to do reactions. But then you've got the ones which are used to measure liquids. So a measuring cylinder, this is a 10 centimeter cubed measuring cylinder. If you wanted to measure out anywhere between zero and 10 milliliters, of a liquid to an accuracy of 0.2 millilitres, then you could use this measuring cylinder. If you wanted to measure out a little bit more, but to an accuracy of 0.5, then you could use this measuring cylinder. And then this one measures up to 100, but with an accuracy of one milliliter. If you wanted specifically 25 millilitres and you wanted it very accurately, instead of using the 25 milliliter measuring cylinder, which is accurate to 0.5 of a milliliter, you could use the 25 centimeter cubed pipette. It has a very fine line here, and if you use it perfectly, then it measures with an accuracy of 0 0.06 milliliters. So much more accurately 25 milliliters than the measuring cylinder would use. These also come as 10 centimeter cubed or 50 or 100, and some of them are even graduated, so you can get numbers between those numbers, but do it much more accurately than you would with the measuring cylinder. We have a volumetric flask, so this one is used for making a solution with specifically 500 millilitres. And this is plus or minus a quarter of a millilitre. Now this measuring cylinder only measures up to 100 and has an accuracy of just one millilitre. This one has an accuracy of plus or minus 0.25 millilitres. So much more accurate way of measuring out exactly 500 centimetres cubed of a solution. And a burette. Similarly, it's just a really accurate way of measuring the volume of solution which has been added. The way that it works is you just fill it up with a liquid and it can measure up to 50 centimetres cubed of liquid being added to a solution, but it can do it really accurately. And so a lot of the time you've got different equipment for the different uses because some of the equipment is used for mixing and some of it is used for measuring. And the ones that are used for measuring have different levels of accuracy. So if you just need about 50 centimetres cubed of a liquid, then by all means just put about 50 centimetres cubed of a liquid into a measuring cylinder and then add it. You know, that's about 50 centimetres cubed and a lot of the time that's fine. But if you want to do a calculation using that number, then you can't use about 50 centimetres cubed because your accuracy will be poor. You want to use exactly 50 centimetres cubed. And so you can measure 50 centimetres cubed to three significant figures but you have to use a 50 centimeter cubed pipette rather than a measuring cylinder. And so basically the equipment is there. If it's important to you how much you add, if it's important for your calculations how much you add, 
then you use one of the accurate pieces of equipment. If it's not that important, you don't have to use an accurate piece of equipment. It's a waste of your time. And so I think that makes it quite clear, the link between experimental chemistry and the theoretical chemistry that we did in the last video with all those quantitative like calculations of amount and concentration and volume. You can only do those really in-depth calculations if you've measured accurately what you've done in experimental chemistry. And so it matters whether you use a 100 centimetre cubed measuring cylinder or a 100 centimetre cubed pipette. Now the other thing I want to talk about, not just experimental to theoretical, that is real chemicals. So we talk a lot about giant structures, giant ionic, giant metallic, giant covalent, simple covalent things. You've done this all at GCSE, but a lot of the time the links I find between those theoretical concepts of giant structures on the molecular scale and the real life structures, so just like a grain of salt or a grain of sand, get blurred. And so people can't link one to the other and that's where a lot of the problems come in. And that's where it all came from. Let's not forget that chemistry originated with just people trying to understand matter. And so they'd say, like, when does this thing melt? How hot do I have to heat this metal to to make it melt? You know, can I melt it in my forge and then make something from it? At what temperature does it boil? Uh, will it conduct electricity? In what states does it conduct electricity? In which states does it not conduct electricity? Is it reactive? What will it react with? Can I burn it? Can I use it to heat my house? These are all the questions that people started off with in chemistry. And a lot of the time we go so much into the theory that people forget how that links to the real life in the real world. And so in GCSE, you split things into giant. And in giant, you've got metals, salts, and then a few covalent things that you've heard of. So diamond, graphite, silicon, sand. Those are the few giant covalent substances there are. And then you have simple substances, which are covalent as well, but they are the liquids and gases. So metals and salts, those tend to be solids. I can only think of one example where it's not, and that's a mercury. Mercury is a liquid metal. And organic chemicals. So a lot of the chemicals from biology are made from simple covalent substances with a fixed amount of atoms in each. Some of them are large and some of them are small, but they are just simple covalent substances. And you learn about the properties of all these things, and it's important to remember those when you go into A-level chemistry. So, metals, for instance, conduct electricity when they're solid and when they're liquid. Metals also conduct heat, and metals tend to have high melting and boiling points. So it takes a lot of energy to melt a metal. It depends on the metal. They vary. Obviously, mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Gallium will melt in the palm of your hand. Aluminium, though, has quite a high melting point, and most metals also have a high melting point. Salts, so ionic compounds, they conduct electricity when molten or when in solution. They also have high melting points, but they aren't good conductors of heat. And covalent substances have very high melting points. Some of them are okay at conducting electricity, like graphite. Some of them are rubbish, like diamond. And that depends upon their structure that we learn about. And with simple compounds, you tend to have liquids and gases, which are the low melting points and boiling points. And they don't conduct electricity because they're electrically neutral. And so quite often in A-level chemistry, people will not know what state something is. So how am, I, how am I supposed to know what the state of calcium bromide is? Well, calcium bromide is a salt, and salts have high melting and boiling points. So it's a solid. If anything is on this list, apart from mercury, everything on this list is a solid. Anything which is simple covalent, we have to talk about in a bit more detail. But everything on this list, metals, salts, and giant covalent things, have very high boiling points often. And they're solids. Now we spend a lot of time talking about these properties. So high melting and boiling point and the things which affect melting and boiling point and the things which affect conductivity. And we do it for giant metals, salts, we do it for covalent things, we do it for liquids and gases, the simple covalent molecules. And we talk about how these link to those abstract ideas of molecules and molecular substances, those things that you only really understand in your head and you can never see. But don't forget that all of these things are things that come from the real world. And so they're things that you can literally see, understand just by normal common sense. Okay, so that's everything I'm going to talk about in this video. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you do choose A-level chemistry. Good luck.